Welcome to the Cross Canada Spotlight. I'm Mike Arsenault, and every week we take a look at some of the most interesting and entertaining stories produced across the Global News Network. And a new season of Rust Valley Restorers is coming to the History Channel, and we got a chance to speak to two of the stars of the show. Rust Valley Restorers is back for another season, transforming abandoned cars to their former glory. There's going to be some interesting twists and turns to look forward to in this season. There's some obscure stuff, some interesting stuff. You'll get to see me jump around like a small gazelle. Um, you'll get to see me in some precarious situations. You'll get to see Mike in some precarious situations. You know what? It's a little bit off the wall this year. The season follows Shof's projects at Wildman Restorations, elaborate rescues of abandoned vehicles, as well as the auction where co-star Mike Hall passed the blowtorch to fans while emptying out his field of dreams in Tappan. I got rid of 40 years of my life in one day. That was, uh, that ran the gamut of emotions, let's put it that way. It was a pretty weird day. I mean, I was dragging them down. I was dragging them back. I'm selling them. I'm keeping them. I'm selling them. I'm keeping them. It was, it was a, one of the hardest things that, that I've done. I mean, after 40 years, they're more like your children than they are like cars. These are just some of the cars left over from the famous Field of Dreams after 550 were sold to buyers from around the world. But the stars of Rust Valley Restorers have no intention of slowing down anytime soon. I really believe they're some of the best we've ever done. Uh, there's tears, there's joy, there's sadness. There's the whole gamut of emotions. We did some amazing, cool builds. We did some rescues that were pretty outlandish. Aerial rescues. I'll give you a little hint. Spoiler alert. Season four of Rust Valley Restorers airs February 24th. For more information about how to tune in, visit our website, globalnews.ca slash Okanagan. Sydney Morton, Global News, Tappan. I cannot think of a show I would be less qualified to appear on. I know next to nothing about cars, but I always feel like I have to pretend I know what I'm talking about when I take my car to a mechanic. So I have no idea how Avery and Mike are able to see those skeletons of vehicles and turn them back into running cars. Now Monday marks the end of Black History Month and in Calgary, some creative dancers are showcasing the history of different dances and shedding light on their painful past. Hitting the stage to share the stories behind the steps. Samba nu pe, so that translates to Samba of the feet, and it originated in Brazil. And here's something that started in the States. Hip-hop and Samba, cultural cousins. People don't know that there's common roots. Joining performers showcasing other styles <laughs> in a production celebrating black history. A mix of dance and dialogue called Unganisha. Unganisha means connection. And I chose that name because I wanted to connect the history of modern styles of dance to its origins, to allow more people to understand that it came from a very gruesome and painful um, circumstance of enslaved Africans being stolen from Africa. With the transatlantic slave trade, I mean, when you have people stolen from their land and brought to, to a new place, a lot of things are stripped from them, things like language, clothing, uh, musical instruments, uh, etc. But the dance could survive. There is this history and it's important for them not to just ignore it. This is a great opportunity to educate to the community. It shows a huge element of respect for the art and where it has come from, those who came before us. This weekend's show was organized long before the easing of COVID restrictions. So they're continuing with plans to present it only online. People are reaching out to us from all over the world, from Africa, Ghana, Congo, Ivory Coast that bought tickets, Denver, Colorado, Chicago, New York, Toronto, Montreal, Vancouver. And because it's Black History Month, this is true Black History. Bill Tucker, Global News. I think it's a good idea that the organizers are keeping the event virtual as it gives them the opportunity to maximize their viewership and the message they want to convey. Our next story combines the lead singer of an ACDC tribute band and a love of typewriters. Have I piqued your interest? Take a look. These are the two worlds of Brendan Raftery, supercharged rock singer by night. Mild-mannered typewriter repairman by day. His new interest was sparked last year when his daughter noticed this relic sitting on the shelf that Brendan had kept for the past 23 years. Dad, what is that thing? <laughs> how do you plug it in and uh, does it work? Since then, he's taught himself how to bring them back to life, saving all kinds of models from the scrap heap. This one's Russian-German. 
Oliver number five. It's from 1913. My favorite is the uh, Torpedo 18B. Channeling his Brian Johnson and Bon Scott helps pay the bills. He also works for Hewlett Packard. But Raftery has sold close to a dozen of these now and has started up old school typewriters. It's a fine line between collecting and hoarding. So I'm just calling it a business. He'll sell to writers, collectors, or maybe anyone looking for a unique piece of art for the Homer office. This tribute to Tom Hanks just finished top three in the typewriter beauty contest at a prestigious competition in the U.S. And yes, that is a real thing. This one is in Hebrew, and it writes from right to left. Life will get busy again as BCDC starts booking more gigs, but Brendan will find time for both. He's already got his bandmates on board. We had a practice a few months ago, and I brought them all their own typewriters. I was like, I mean, I had a few. <laughs> Now he just has to work on a jingle for his new company. Uh, you know, we could sort of morph an ACDC song into typewriters, and you know, that's, that's coming now that you put that in my head. Those about to type, <laughs> we salute you. <laughs> Jay Durant, Global News. I had no idea that in 2022, there was such a market for typewriters. I've only used a typewriter once in my life. I was like 10 years old and my grandpa had one. I tried it for five minutes and didn't enjoy it at all as I'm not a very accurate typer. For example, this script I'm reading right now would have taken me like an hour to write out on a typewriter. And another example of entrepreneurial spirit, a couple new to Canada is now selling a family recipe to those looking to spice things up a bit. So right now I'm just crushing the salted duck egg yolks into smaller, uh or mushing it so it's a bit more uh, fine. Inside a shared kitchen in Vancouver, Christopher Fung is cooking up a family specialty, a recipe handed down from his wife's grandmother. So the preparation, the infusion of the aromatics can take hours. I'm talking about 10 hours plus. It's called, wait for it, Holy Duck. Well, that's the brand name. It's actually duck chili oil. I was looking for a good chili oil for myself to enjoy and I go to the grocery store. All of them are imported. All of them have been sitting on the shelves for months or even over a year. A little bit of time. The husband and wife team moved here from Hong Kong at the beginning of the pandemic. Initially, they made the oil for loved ones, delivering it on their doorsteps. It's your favorite part. That taste of home, especially meaningful during Chinese New Year. Now, at the urging of friends and family, they're selling it. The duck fat gives a very uh, thick and uh, almost, I want to say, kind of like a creamy texture. It kind of coats your mouth when you, when, you, when you taste it. Fraser Valley Poultry is one of their suppliers, providing ingredients free of hormones and antibiotics. We're, we hope to, uh, I guess, in a way, educate people a bit more about our culture and they can enjoy our food. In just the first few months of business, they sold 1,000 jars. Holy Duck is available at five stores and online. Its creators hopeful it will soon be flying off store shelves. Catherine Urquhart, Global News. I am definitely not the target audience for Holy Duck. My body and spice don't get along so well. In fact, I was once in a salsa eating competition and quit at the medium spice level but I'm sure spice lovers would be all over that chili oil. Now, I produce a monthly segment for Global News called The Training Ground, where I interview high achievers from different careers and vocations to learn about what it takes to be at the top of their field. This month, I spoke to one of the members of the James Webb Telescope team. I was sort of towards the end of my high school years that I realized that I'm interested in the story of our origins. I decided to do physics for my undergrad. And then sort of one thing led to another and uh, I ended up doing astrophysics uh, for a living. How much of being an astronomer is just a general curiosity about the origins of the cosmos and the ability to be well-versed and, and very good at doing physics and having that, that intelligence there, that math just comes easy for you? 
I wouldn't say math comes really easy for me. I wouldn't say physics comes really easy for me, but I'm reasonably decent at them. And I'm also decent at computer programming. And I think those are the, the things that you have to be decent at that. And uh, you can have a very successful career in astronomy. From a layman's perspective, can you explain exactly what you're doing in your work in astronomy? The kind of astronomy I do is uh, trying to identify and study things that existed billions of years ago. So, you know, you may have heard the term uh, baby galaxies. That's something that the recently launched uh, Webb Space Telescope is going to study. We take their pictures in different colors, different uh, uh, wavelengths of light, so green, red, blue, and so on. We can try to guess what are the processes occurring in these, in these very, very distant galaxies. The James Webb Telescope recently launched and you were intricately involved in that project. What was your role in getting that off the ground, pun intended, and what does it hope to achieve? I've been involved with the Webb Telescope for about 20 years. Our role is to specify what kind of uh, capabilities the instrument has to have and then uh, guide the development of the instrument. The science we want to do is to find the very first galaxies that formed after the Big Bang and then to study how they grew over time into things uh, like our own Milky Way galaxy. My last question for you, Marcin, is an existential one, because whenever I think about our place in the cosmos and, and how old the universe is and how young we actually are, we're just basically a, a blip, a, a, a finger snap in the entire timeline of the universe. I start thinking about the ins insignificance of life. I start to get a little bit depressed and then I stop thinking about it. So how are you able to put yourself thinking about these big picture things over and over again? The way I think about it is, is, is not uh, how little we are, but just how amazing and how vast the universe is. And that I think is, is very inspiring that, uh, that we are part of this incredibly large and very old thing called the universe. We have our place in this story and we have existed as uh, individual atoms, as individual particles, all the way from the beginning of, of the universe. Okay, Marcin, next time I have those feelings, I'll look at it through your lens. That, that will help me, hopefully, when those feelings of dread start to uh, wash over me. I really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you so much, and uh, best of luck with, with your work with the James Webb Telescope. Since that interview, I have been trying to use Marcin's advice when thinking about big existential topics about the universe. It has been working okay. Well, that's it for the Cross Canada Spotlight. Be sure to watch Global News Weekend Saturday and Sunday mornings at 7 a.m on the Global TV app and Amazon Prime Video.